Thank you so much for this invitation. It's a great honor to be here. And I have to say that coming in as an outsider, as a philosopher, as not part of uh, this specific community and center, I have already learned a lot this morning. So I'm really happy to be here. And yeah, thank you all for, for having me. Um, I'm going to talk about the critique of capitalism uh, as during the, we, we didn't have a discussion, but I mean, some, some of you have already assumed that the good life would be a life with maybe even a transformed capitalism, and I'm going to look into those positions who uh, <coughs> critique capitalism uh, in a certain way, assuming that there's no good life within capitalism. So the critique of capitalism is <laughs> In great, and I mean, I've, it, 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 is, uh, it, it has been very interesting for me already to, uh, to hear how many of you have referred to Aristotle, to values, to the good life, and maybe later on we could discuss whether these two approaches, these two dynamics are not at odds with each other in a certain, certain respect. The very dynamics of capitalism and the idea that there is a good life and virtues that uh, have a certain limit. Uh, I mean, this whole uh, Aristotelian idea uh, and critique of uh, Pleonex here. Yeah. You're laughing, Marcus, already? No, no, no. <laughs> okay, so, but now I'm going to, um, um, to talk about the critique of capitalism and actually I'm going to investigate it uh, rather critically. The critique of capitalism is in great demand shaped by the mood of the times, shaped by current crisis that we experience. This critique may be diffused, sometimes insufficiently complex, and in some respects even disconcertingly inflationary. Nevertheless, there are good, good reasons for this boom, and uh, you have pointed uh, out some of them already, the rising inequality, the ecological disaster has not been uh, in the foreground right now, but I think that this is going to uh, play a role as well. As well. But what then is really the problem with capitalism? Is it wrong? Is it unjust? Is it irrational or bad? Is it evil or dumb? Or is it just not working? To ask this question in another way, on what basis is capitalism subject to criticism? In this paper, other than you, I cannot offer a new empirical diagnosis of the current state of the world economy, or even constructive, make constructive suggestions to alleviate the crisis. <coughs> What I, being only a philosopher, would much rather do is the following. To examine and to interrogate from a methodological point of view three approaches to the critique of capitalism. I will examine how they proceed and which possibilities they develop for a critique of capitalism as a specific type of economic and social organization. So the question, what if anything is wrong with capitalism, is not meant cynically. I do not doubt that there is something problematic about the global economic system and the constitution of our societies. But it appears far less self-evident to me which of the many maladies in the world can be traced back spe specifically to capitalism, or whether there is, as Philip van Paris asked, something intrinsically wrong with capitalism. Is there something then that is not just a side effect of some chance peculiarity of capitalism, but which occurs systematically in conjunction with it, and only with it, something that is moreover fundamentally problematic. The object of our critique, if it is to be a critique of capitalism, can surely neither be something that occurs in all conceivable forms of society, nor can the critique, if it's to be a critique of capitalism, pertain to something that occurs only incidentally in connection with it. In other words, if something in the social systems under consideration is supposed to be wrong or problematic, is it in fact capitalism that is to carry the blame, rather than say modernity or even the conditio humana in general? In the context of my reflections here, the term capitalism shall designate a social and economic order encompassing the whole ensemble of economic, social, cultural, and political practices and institutions that make up the capitalist form of life. So capitalism and society too, capitalist societies as societies, as an institutional social order, the economy not being the other of society, but a part of it. 
as Phelps says, economy as it is realized in a social context and the other way around, the, so the social context as it is marked and stamped by capitalism. So what then is the problem with capitalism? If we leave aside trivial indict indictments against personal greed, let us distinguish three strat strategies, strategies of critique. First, a functional argument. Capitalism cannot function as a social and economic system. It is intrinsically dysfunctional and crisis prone. Second, a moral or justice oriented mode of argument. Capitalism is based on exploitation. It withholds from people in an unfair and unjust way the fruits of their own labor and it entraps them in servitude to a system that cheats them of what they are due. Briefly, and less dramatically put, capitalism is either based on an unjust and exploitative social structure or it produces one. The third, the ethical argument, goes like this. A life shaped by capitalism is a bad life. It is impoverished, without meaning or empty, and it destroys essential components of a fulfilled, happy, and above all, truly free human life. We have already heard about this and about Marx's critique of alienation, which of course is one of the most prominent uh, uh, defenders of this position. So in short, capitalism leads or to and is based on alienation. All these three strategies have each had a respective boom period and it's maybe interesting to see that in Marx in some way, all three strategies are uh, converge in an interesting way, but it's not always transparent how they converge. So let us ask for each of these lines of argumentation whether they meet the demand established above. That is, whether they establish a mode of critique that targets the specific wrongs of capitalism. In particular, we will determine whether each critique grasps capitalism's specific traits and uh, second, uh, um, criterion accounts for its wrongness or its normative shortfalls. I will begin with the functional critique. The functional strategy of argumentation runs, capitalism does not function as a social and economic system, it's intrinsically dysfunctional and crisis prone. There are some um, evidences uh, with respect to functional critique and it's interesting to see how the functional critique and the functional argument has, uh, is somehow in more demand than it used to be with respect to, I mean, uh, with respect to the ecological crisis. You hear a lot of uh, um, uh, critiques of capitalism that basically buy into the functional argument. So the functional argument has some advantages. It seemingly relies on no external standard of justification uh, because something that does not function uh, is not good on its own term. It undermines its own uh, reason for being in some way. It's intrinsically dysfunctional. You all know some of the uh, variants of a functional uh, critique of capitalism. Uh, the easiest to contents is probably the pauperization theory that uh, Marx sold uh, in its early times. Uh, there is a bit more sophisticated um, uh, functional critique of capitalism in Marxism that, um, <clears throat> that works out the tendential fall of the rate of profit. Um, but it's maybe interesting and, and, and important to see that functional critique is not uh, only uh, prominent in Marxism and it's also not only something that uh, uh, that refers to the ecological uh, crisis or to uh, economical crisis scenarios, not only as I have suggested already the ecology and the ecological crisis uh, uh, runs very prominent here, um, even the idea that there are cultural preconditions for capitalism to function and that those very cultural preconditions are somehow undermined is something uh, that already Daniel Bell but also Joseph Schumpeter uh, has put forward. Both of them argue in some way that capitalism systematically undermines necessary psychic and cognitive dispositions <coughs> that it at the same time needs in order to conserve itself. So just to give you an, uh, uh, an idea of how broad the functional argument is and that it's not actually uh, uh, just an economic argument. 
So the ad advantages as I've uh, pointed out already, and ook, now I'm uh, talking about uh, the problems. The problems with the functional argument is uh, basically that functionality is always embedded in norms and in the case of capitalism is contested. So if we talk about something being functional, we have to ask for whom is it functional and with respect to what is it functional. What then is a functional deficiency? And if something is functionally deficient, that means that it's not functioned as it is supposed to be. It does not function as promised or in accordance with its prescribed task. The task of a knife is to cut. A blunt knife is not functioning to the extent that it's not cutting. But the ascription of systematic functional def deficit, deficit goes beyond the mere factual circumstance that something is not functioning as it should by claiming that it is not able to do so for systemic reasons. And this is something that uh, most of the functional critiques of, of capitalism have tried to make this argument, that it's not just an empirical thing and also not just, uh, now let's say, an empirical failure like market failures, but something that is deep in the DNA of, this, uh, of those social practices and institutions. So it lacks the requirements necessary to function as it's respected. This is what I would call a systematic non-functionality. So the problems uh, uh, are easy to spell out. Very often, multiple potentially distinct meanings here are conflated. So we could say in the case of the cap capitalist economic system that here something now functions such that in the long run, thus in the future, it will no longer function. Again, the ecological uh, crisis argument. So that the overexploitation of natural resources would be an example of this. It enables us now to maintain a certain level of prosperity, but it may threaten future conditions for human life. Alternatively, however, we could say that something functions in one particular regard or respect while it doesn't function in the other. The dynamic economic development connected with capitalist modernization has indeed created astonishing amounts of wealth, but this prosperity has not come to benefit everybody in equal measure, as we have seen. But is this a sign of dysfunctionality? With respect to the housing market, it might be functional for investors, but dysfunctional for the homeless. With respect to the crisis of care, and one of my pictures alludes to this, it's a bit uh, more difficult to spell out how this would be functional uh, uh, to anyone if our uh, respective care uh, systems um, become dysfunctional, but even then there are people who are able to buy the, their way out. So uh, the idea that dysfunctionality always sees us all in one boat, so to say, uh, so the whole boat will be, uh, uh, everyone will suffer from this dysfunctionality is just not true. Um, so I am not doubting that there are functional crises, and as I said, there are the idea of a functional crisis is much more prominent now than it used to be. Uh, I'm just uh, uh, asking whether we should pursue this, these problems within the parameters or of a purely functional critique. Uh, and what I'm going to, what I'm arguing here is that we should be aware uh, of the fact that functional critique inevitably engages in teleological and value-laden judgments. Something is functional only in relation to something. Now with capitalism, it's less clear what its function should be. A lot of you seem to assume that its function is uh, to, uh, to organize, uh, its function is to, to secure well-being and uh, pros uh, pro prosperity and well-being, uh, but you could also argue that the only function that we can see in, in capitalism is a kind of never-ending accumulative dynamic uh, from which it is very hard to see uh, under which uh, uh, criteria this has become dysfunctional. So even if you can argue capitalism is uh, somehow biting its own tail or is undermining its, uh, its preconditions of existence, uh, the argument that, I mean, who who cares, who cares about the future is at least systematically a valid one. It's actually something that a lot of people <laughs> obviously uh, are still, uh, uh, still thinking. So, so even here, only under the condition that you want the future for your children be a sustainable one uh, is 
uh, capitalism dysfunctional with respect to economic crisis. So functional critique is able, if it is true, or if those analyses are true, might be able to uncover a problematic specific to capitalism, but it fails to account for its normative wrongness. So it is somehow parasitic to uh, normativity and uh, uh, say value-laden, theologically value-laden environment in order to uh, make its point. Let us now turn to two versions of a, norm of a critique of capitalism that is normative from the very outset uh, and that has other kinds of problems, as I will argue. So the second uh, argument, as I've already said, is a moral argument. Capitalism is either based on an unjust and exploitative social structure or produces one. So what is the problem with the moral argument? I'm going to... Um, take a shortcut here. Uh, it has huge advantages. The moral critique of capitalism uh, in political mobilization it ha has turned out to have a high mobilizi mobilizing power and also uh, uh, some, um, uh, some undeniable uh, 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 facts uh, to point to. It corresponds well to everyday intuitions about the moral wrongs uh, of capitalism. But the problem is what exactly is understanding, what exactly is the unjustness, what does the unjustness of, uh, of, of, of uh, capitalism exist in? And this is, uh, as would be worth to spell out in a bit more uh, detail, already not so clear within Marx. But let me just stay with the fact, because I'm going to, uh, 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 I don't want to, to overstretch my time. Um, let me just uh, stop with, saying that uh, according to the two criteria that I have uh, established, the problem of the moral critique of capitalism uh, is very often that it doesn't show that it's, uh, it's analytically weak, that it doesn't show capitalism to be systematically exploitative or exploitation specific to capitalism. After all, uh, feudal societies uh, have been unjust or exploitative as well, so what is needed is an analysis of a specific kind of exploitation uh, as we find it in capitalism. So this everyday understanding of exploitation as being unjust does not help us with uh, uh, the question of an intrinsically wrong of capitalism. Now Marx, of course, has added this kind of analysis, even if, uh, if you might doubt its results, but he has um, uh, um, come about with an explanation of exploitation that uh, as an analytical technical concept uh, targets capitalism in a more specific way. The problem, besides of all the empirical problems with this and besides of uh, the discussions about uh, uh, the labor theory of value and so on, it is this technical, um, analytical technical concept that is able to target capitalism in a specific way is not in itself normative as well. Which then leads us to, actually already leads us to the, the question of values and the question of the ethics or the ethical life of capitalism. What, if we, uh, if we ask ourselves what kind of wrong Marx sees in capitalism, um, it is easy to see uh, and, 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 and if we try to, to understand how Marx could have said capitalism is not unjust as such, or is not only unjust as such, it is easy to see that he's already um, um, aiming at an ethical life uh, critique of uh, capitalism, that this moral critique of unjust distribution uh, is not enough, and that what he does is to question what can be called the proto-values of a form of life that are at stake. So it is, in Marx, of course, it is um, uh, uh, um, not, uh, capitalism is not a moral scandal because it des designates a ca capitalism's mode, uh, mode, of, uh, mode of production uh, uh, as such. And in order to get to the let's say, broader idea of uh, capitalism being unjust, you need to turn uh, to the broader ethical life that capitalism is embedded in.
Let no, let's now turn to the ethical argument against capitalism shortly. The ethical argument says that capitalism destroys essential components of a fulfilled, happy, and free life it leads to and is based on alienation. What is important about the ethical critique of capitalism, even uh, the kind of ethical critique that you might uh, criticize as somehow being a nostalgic, uh, just critique of culture, even this uh, has its advantage in that it shows us that life in capitalism entails certain proto-values that are very often naturalized. So it shows us that, for example, uh, the idea of values as we find them in market uh, transactions is not just ethically neutral. It's not just uh, val what values are, but it's something that is already has, has a, a whole historical and social context uh, to even see of certain goods as commodities that may, might be changed and so on. This is something that uh, the ethical critique <coughs> um, has been, been pointing to uh, in a successful way. The problem, uh, also the focus on the culture of capitalism, the context of the capitalist economy and its effects on our forms of life is something uh, that I think is uh, very meaningful with respect to um, an encompassing critique of capitalism. The problems with this kind of critique is that it's specific to capitalism is again debatable. So some of the ethical critiques of capitalism, think of, uh, let's say, already Werner Zombat, who uh, was, um, uh, I mean, who, who in, in his modern capitalism uh, talks about how meaningful, uh, how meaningful the relation between uh, uh, the agriculture and the cow was as against this meaningless uh, and indifference that we find in modern life. So even here, it's debatable whether this is modernity as such, a certain kind of rationality in modernity, uh, and uh, the idea of indifference as something that is also um, 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 something that we need in order to, uh, uh, to live a certain kind of freedom. So it's debatable, uh, debatable whether it's specific, it's debatable uh, in terms of the ambivalence of the phenomena. So the kind of indifference that is very, very often criticized is at the same time a precondition for freedom. I can do what I want unless uh, I interfere in what you do. Uh, and the criteria for normative assessments are somehow unclear. I mean, most of, most of you uh, know that when uh, the railway was, was uh, invented, the cultural critiques uh, were uh, I mean, I thought that this kind of uh, acceleration would make people crazy. Uh, nowadays, everyone uh, somehow raves about railway going, I mean, going very slow instead of flying as something that is uh, the appropriate uh, 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 way to do things and way to uh, be in a relation to the world. So, again, those criteria are very often uh, quite unclear. And then the next problem that is important for uh, my last panel, what, what I have to say is that very often those critiques um, are uh, 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 somehow embedded in the idea of a colonization of the life road or of certain kind of <coughs> sphere differentiation uh, so that the idea is always that the capitalist econ uh, economy uh, somehow colonizes uh, the life world colonizes spheres of life that are otherwise uh, somehow uh, pure and uh, uh, should should be treated shouldn't be treated in in this way. And I think that the whole metaphor and the whole idea of uh, of spheres here is a bit problematic with respect to what I pointed to in the beginning. That I think we should see econo the economy as part of society and not as it's others. So the idea that it's always economy that colonizes a society might be wrong. Maybe uh, sometimes the economy itself is colonized by certain kinds of uh, capitalist economies. Um, yeah. So in sum, all of the three paths offer fruitful insights. Each of them proves sufficient in various ways. Functional critique is specific to capitalism, but normatively parasitic. Moral critique is normatively informative, but not specific to capitalism. 
and ethical critique has difficulty identifying normative criteria, specificity to capitalism needs to be uh, spelled out. I think that it would be possible to do it, but it's seldomly done. So what should we do uh, with respect to this rather negative, if we want to criticize capitalis uh, capitalism with respect to this rather ne negative summary? Um, I would suggest to uh, critique capitalism as a form of life, uh, which is not the same as an ethical critique, uh, since capitalism as a form of life entails economic, social, cultural, political practices and institutions. They are intertwined, <coughs> arranged, and connected in multiple ways. The analysis, then, should aim at understanding the functional disturbances and the normative deficits of capitalism as a form of life, uh, taking into account that uh, functions and also dysfunctions and functional crises are already also normative crises. So the criterion then for a form of life, capitalism as a form of life, uh, um, would be the idea of an unhindered and accumulating learning process, a process of experience that is triggered by crisis um, and that shows its rationality. And I'm not talking here about value and the need for new ethics because I'm a bit uh, uh, um, more reluctant with respect to where this we and our common values should come from. So the idea here is that uh, it's exactly the, uh, the way in which the normative and the functional is intertwined that shows us the crisis that might show us uh, where to go, and it's exactly the, uh, the question of what blocks a certain kind of learning, a certain uh, kind of overcoming crisis that normatively might uh, show us the way here. Maybe uh, as a last sentence, uh, as, a, as, a, as a last point, I mean, it's not so clear how capitalism um, does with respect to a successful form of life that does not hinder but facilitates successful collective learning processes. It has been said that it is exactly capitalism that is so dynamic and uh, enables those learning processes, but I think it's a good, good idea to look at our uh, current affairs, uh, at the multiple crises, the multiple intertwined crises that somehow seem to reinforce each other with respect uh, to the question and with the criterion uh, of what has happened in order to stop this crisis-driven learning process. And maybe uh, with respect to the warning that we have heard uh, about uh, democracy or the idea of a de democratic uh, economy, reconstructing, transform the economy uh, according to uh, some kind of uh, a democratic criterion, I would say that the good life for people and the normative stakes that they have in deciding and coming up with uh, uh, ideas about how to overcome this crisis. The normative stakes uh, are not only that people want uh, a good life in terms of welfare, they want to have a say. And they want to be as uh, the wrong side uh, <laughs> uh, uh, um, 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 always evokes, they want to be, uh, want to get back control. So it's not just about a society marked by less inequality, but it's also about a society uh, that is organized such that collective democratic learning processes uh, find their place. Thank you so much.